Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. All praises belong to Allah. We praise Allah. And we ask him for guidance and for forgiveness. We seek protection in Allah from the malice of our own souls and from the evil of our own actions. Whom Allah guides, no one can lead them astray. And whom he makes astray, no one can lead them back to the right path. I bear witness that there is no other deity but Allah alone, having no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the servant and messenger of Allah. You who believe, be mindful of God, as is his due. And make sure you devote yourselves to him until your dying moment. Believers, be mindful of God. Speak in a direct fashion and to good purpose, and he will put your deeds right for you and for forgive and forgive you your sins. Whoever obeys Allah and his messenger will truly achieve a great triumph. Assalamu uh, my dear sisters and brothers. Welcome back. I'm back again two weeks in a row. Um, inshallah, I will feel that this uh, reflection, this talk, um, it will be a bit more organized, but it is a continuation of what we were talking about last week. Um, and that, that with that conversation being about um, leadership and what it takes to be a good leader. And we remember from last week that uh, Allah has cited numerous traits um, in humans that all of us must overcome in order to attain that end goal of tranquility and peace and communal harmony and, and really closeness to Allah. And so last week we talked about weakness, impatience, anxiousness, hastiness, unjustness, ungratefulness, being miserly, being contentious and quarrelsome. Allah has mentioned those, those traits in the Quran. Um, and that these traits are some of the elements that hinder our ability to be a good leader. And all of us are leaders in some capacity in our lives. And do take a moment to think about what realms you are a leader in. Now, today I want to share a few stories that display what I believe to be great leadership in Islamic history. And they pertain specifically to the leadership of Omar ibn al-Khattab, the second caliph of Islam. And so inshallah, the lessons we take away from these stories will both empower and encourage us in our own lives. They will present a mindset and course of action that we can utilize in our own ways. Now I can go into great length as to how he, for instance, structured and established the government of the Islamic empire, how he intelligently and thoughtfully divided provinces and assigned governors, and how he strategically directed military excursions, et cetera, et cetera. Rather, I want to share moments where he displayed immense compassion, humility, mercy, and understanding, because these are cues that we can take for ourselves. So let's go back in time, back to the year 638, uh, where uh, in Arabia, um, the area had fallen into severe drought, which then followed by famine. And so soon after that, the reserves of food in Medina began to run out. Now, Omar ordered caravans of supplies from Syria and Iraq and personally supervised their distribution. His actions saved countless lives throughout Arabia. When starvation struck the inhabitants of Medina, he forbade his own stomach from meat. And there's a known commentary that relays this, quote, during the year of ashes of drought and famine, Omar ibn Khattab's stomach would make rumbling sounds. He forbade himself from eating ghee and so would only eat olive oil. And he would poke his stomach with his fingers and say, rumble as much as you want, for indeed, I will feed you nothing other than this until the situation of the people improves. This is the leader of the Muslim people and the swaths of land within the empire. Indeed, he could have eaten meat if he wanted. He is the caliph, right? This was also the same year that thousands of Bedouins had encamped on the outskirts of Medina. And they received their provisions and daily food rations from the depleting Muslim treasury while Omar would feed, feed them himself. And yet at the end of the drought, his eyes flooded with tears 
to see the people packing their belongings and departing back to their villages. So that's one story, one example of that humility and humbleness that he, um, Omar al-Khattab would, would pass out the provisions. He would ensure that people are getting their provisions on his own watch, with his own eyes, with his own hands. Reflect on that. Another story um, that I want to mention, um, and this is, there's like all stories, right? There's always variances. There's always slight differences. But this one um, was sourced from Iman, I, I, Imam al-Qurtubi. And he mentions one, one incident, his tafsir, that one day Omar bin Khattab was walking with his companion al-Jarud. And he met a woman outside the mosque. He greeted the woman, welcomed her warmly. And she returned the greeting by saying this, O Omar, okay, O Omar, not Amir al-Mutma'in, right? Not leader of the faithful. O Omar, I remember you when you were little, Omar, in the marketplace, the Bukaz, taking care of your sheep with your stick. And then days passed, and you were called Omar. And then days passed by, and you are now called Amir al-Mutma'in, leader of the faithful. Okay, so she starts off by this sort of reminiscing, right? I remember you when you were this small. Okay, this is the leader, the leader of the Ummah at this time. So she continues and she says, now she offers some advice. She says, so fear Allah in your role as caliph, taking care of the people, and know that one who fears the threat of punishment in the hereafter realizes that it is not far away. And the one who fears death fears missing some opportunity in this life. Hearing her words, Omar's eyes filled with tears. And, and his companion, al Jarud chastised this woman, not just for her words, but also for causing Omar to be affected by them in such a way. But Omar said to him, woe to you. Do you not know who this is? He said, this is Khawla bint Thalaba, the woman whose complaint Allah listened to from above, above the seven heavens. By Allah, if she did not leave me until night fell, I would not leave her until she got what she came for. Unless the time for prayer came, in which case I would pray and then I would come back to her until she got what she came for. This is Omar ibn Khattab. We'll talk later about sort of his reputation pre-Islam. But again, he is still the leader of the people. And this one woman sitting outside the mosque who came to talk to him, this old lady, he entertained her first right? He greeted her, he, he listened to her, and then he was affected by her words, by her advice. The last story is a little bit longer, but it's, it's, it's worth, worth the listen if you haven't heard this story. It's one of my favorite stories. And probably the, my, the most entertaining um, version I've heard is by um, uh, Professor Roy Casagranda, local to Austin, um, if you find his YouTube channel from the Austin School, um, this this bit of the story is from a longer story about Ibn uh, Khalid Ibn Walid. Highly recommend listening to um, to that lecture or any of his lectures, really. Okay, so now we're going to jump back to the year 737, when the Muslim armies had had taken over control of Iraq and Syria and um, were beginning to appear in the vicinity of Jerusalem. So had, they had taken Iraq and Syria and Palestine, except for Jerusalem. They're on the edges of Jerusalem. And in charge of Jerusalem was uh, the patriarch Sophronius, Sur uh, Sur sorry. So he was a representative of the Byzantine Empire, as well as the leader of the Christian church. Um, and so although numerous Muslim armies under the, under the control of Khalid ibn Walid and Amr and, uh, ibn al-As began to surround the cities, Sophronius refused to surrender the city unless Omar came to accept the surrender himself. So having heard such a condition, Omar ibn Khattab left Medina, traveling only with uh, one camel and his servant. Okay, so he arrives into Jerusalem. And Sophronius has uh, now comes out to the the gates to meet the caliph, right? The leader of this empire, this army that has, in a very short period of time, taken over Iraq, Syria, Palestine, and, and is about to take Jerusalem. So he goes out to greet him. And he sees a man leading a camel at the front of the army. Uh, and so 
for record, Roy, Professor Roy goes into this. It's quite interesting, a little antidote, but rich Arabs, and especially those who are good soldiers, he says, don't usually ride camels. They're going to come in on a horse, not just any horse, an Arabian horse. Okay. Um, camels are a bit, you know, clumsy and slow and Arabian horses are very elegant and fast and agile. Right. Um, so you wouldn't expect to see a camel leading an army, but here we are with a camel. And uh, Sophronius comes out to meet the caliph, and he's uh, Sophronius is dressed uh, like a person of his stature and his his position. He's he's got a big red hat. It's uh, dangling with gold tassels, like real gold. Um, he's covered in gold jewelry. He's wearing his robes. He's covered in perfume, and he's being carried out on electica, right? You know, like that couch that the Romans would ride. Uh, with people carrying them. And then there's more people fanning him, keeping him cool. So he comes to the guy on the camel, looks up to the guy on the camel, and he says, where's the caliph? And the guy on the camel nods down to the to the guy standing next to the camel. And, and the guy holding the, the camel's reins says, I'm the caliph. Sophronius is sort of taken aback by this because this guy is like dressed in rags, all right? Um, his, his pants were mended. His shirts had multiple areas that had been mended. Um, and Sophronius is, is like asking him, you, you, you are the leader of the army that just conquered Iraq and Syria and all of Palestine minus Jerusalem. Why are you so poor? And Omar responds very humbly. He says, um, you know, I'm, I'm just a humble man with humble needs. And Sophronius goes, why aren't you riding your camel? And Omar says, well, this is my servant and we take turns. So neither one of us gets exhausted. And Sophronius is very like, what just happened here? Who just conquered us? So he gets off of his lectica and he tells Omar, you know, I want to talk to you about surrendering the city to you. And Omar says, I have an idea. Let's walk to the city and I'll tell you what I'm thinking the terms uh, would be. And we'll start from there. So as they're walking on the road, Omar says, you know, why don't, we just have all the Roman politicians leave Jerusalem. They can take whatever they can carry, but they have to leave. And Sophronius is thinking, like, this is tell them, this is this is very reasonable. I, you know, I assumed that you would, you know, kind of come and enslave us and take our gold. And if you're not, I mean, no one's gonna be mad about that. I'm sure we can agree to that. What else do you want? And Omar says, No, that's it. That's all I was thinking. Just I want the, the Romans to leave. They can take what they can carry, and that's it. Sophronius is super confused by this because that's not how they, the Byzantines or the Romans would operate. You know, they would plunder a city, they would enslave people, they would maybe destroy things. Um, and Omar goes, no, 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 that's not what we're going to do. No plundering, no raping, no enslaving. We're not going to do that stuff. We don't do that stuff. And um, so Sophronius asks, like, you're not going to take any property? And Omar says, no, 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 we don't want any property. We just want, we just want the Romans to leave. So Sophronius is like, well, there's there's really nothing to negotiate. You have the city. It's yours. We surrender it to you. So they walk into the city, right? And as they're walking some more, Sophronius asks Omar, you know, can you tell me, tell me about your religion? So Omar starts telling him about Islam. And Sophronius goes, you know, this sounds a lot like Christianity. I mean, I kind of feel like we have something similar here. And Omar agrees. Yeah, like, because we are, you know, we've, we've come from the same message and, um, we're just, you know, Professor kind of jokes by this. It's like Judaism. We just thought we were Judaism 3.0, and it never occurred to us that we were going to be received as anything so different. Okay, so Sophronius says, yeah, "Listen, because you're you've given us such amazing terms, and because I feel like there's some type of kinship between our religions, would you do me the honor? Will you come to my church and pray in your Muslim way next to me, and I pray in my Christian way? What do you think, Omar says?" He says, nope, never, never going to do it. Sophronius is like, why? Why not? Like, you know, you thought we had like, we had some connection here. And Omar says, because I'm the caliph. The first place I pray in Jerusalem is going to be a mosque. The Muslims will make it a mosque. And I don't want you to lose your church. So Sophronius is like, all right, well, why don't we just find an empty piece of Jerusalem and we'll pray there. So they do. They find an empty lot and they pray together the archbishop in his Christian way and Omar in the Muslim way, side by side. That spot where they prayed is a mosque today and it commemorates 
that first time that Omar prayed in Jerusalem. And he knew it. He knew what was going to happen. He knew that whatever he did was going to become a mosque. And he didn't want that church to be destroyed. And to this day, that church is still present in Jerusalem. So Omar continues and says to Sophronius, you know, I'd like to see the Temple Mount. Sophronius is like, why? Omar goes, because it's holy. It's holy to everybody. It's holy to us. It's holy to you. It's holy to the Jews. And Sophronius admits to Omar that, you know, they haven't been treating the Temple Mount very well. That after the Christians tore down the second Temple of Solomon, uh, when they conquered Palestine, they kind of turned the area into like a garbage dump as a punishment to the Jews. And Omar asked to be shown the Temple Mount anyway. And when they get there, he can't believe what he's looking at. He falls to the knees and begins clearing away the garbage by his hands. And the army, they see him and they come and they help. They see their leader on his knees clearing garbage, right? So they run up and they start clearing the garbage themselves. And they clear all the garbage off the Temple Mount. Again, compassion, humility, mercy, understanding, coming from a leader. I mean, leader, capital L. Can you think of one political leader who can claim to exemplify these attributes? I can hardly name a religious leader who reflects these traits. So I want us to ruminate on these stories and soak in these lessons that we can, um, that we can gather from them. I say this saying of mine, and I seek forgiveness from Allah for me and for you and to the rest of the Muslims. So ask him for forgiveness. He is the forgiver, the merciful. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah. In the name of Allah and exaltations be to Allah and blessings and peace be upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay. So, you know, I'm not here to claim that Omar was a perfect person or a perfect leader. He was human after all, right? But it's not for us to judge his piety or his decisions or his actions, right? That's not what we're here to do. However, we can learn from these stories, right? And, and all of the variances. You know, if you do the research, you'll find that there's always little details that are, that are different from one, um, one, one tafsir to another, one commentary to another, okay? But still read them, learn them as a way to remind ourselves that we too can embody these positive leadership skills and, and traits in our own lives. I hope you leave this talk reflecting on these stories as a way to implement them in your own actions and thoughts and not just not just as a way to gain pride, you know, in our Islamic history, right? Oh, we, we had these great leaders and look at how great they were. No, 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 no. Use them as an example to better yourself. And when I think about Omar ibn al-Khattab, what I find most remarkable about these character stories is not just the person he was as leader of the faithful or, or even who he was as companion of the prophet. But seeing that person in comparison to who he was when he was enemy of Islam, you know, in Mecca, we know of his reputation. He had a reputation of being tough, direct, physically powerful. He was a great orator, right? He could, he could, he could communicate really well. He was both admired and feared for his harshness. Okay, all of that garnered a lot of respect and admiration, even so much that on numerous occasions, he stood as ambassador of the Quraysh. And you also may know that Omar almost single-handedly ended Islam shortly after it began to spread to the wider Meccan community. Omar was so hateful of the message, and he believed Islam would divide and destroy the Quraysh that he vowed to assassinate the Prophet himself. And he was actually on his way to end the Prophet's life when he ran into a friend. And that friend had secretly converted to Islam, but didn't tell Omar. Omar tells the friend of what is his intent, right, to kill the Prophet. And the friend, send, friend uh, said, said to him, you know, why don't you worry about, what, about your own home, right, your own family, your own house, indicating to Omar Omar's own sister and her family had already converted to Islam. So you can imagine 
this enraged him, like the nth degree. And Omar went to her house. What did he see? He saw her husband reciting Quran. Again, further angering him, and a quarrel ensued. And his sister, who had come out uh, to her husband's aid, was struck by Omar, causing her to bleed. This was a man who extremely hated Islam and the Prophet and his followers to the point of wanting to kill people because of it. And yet he himself gave his life to Islam and to the community of believers. He didn't have to be the way that he was. He could have been a different type of leader. He could have been given the power. He could have been given the title and executed in a very different way. And he didn't. He was the person that would be brought to tears when an old woman reminded him of his duty to the people. He was a man who was brought to tears, seeing famine and hardships beyond his people, who would, who would give up his own pleasures because those around him could not enjoy them as well. And this was a man who truly showed just immense foresight and leadership in Jerusalem, dealing with people he basically just conquered. So may Allah put even a sliver of that type of transformation in each one of our own hearts. Allah, please accept our good deeds and our good intentions. And forgive us our shortcomings and missteps and allow us to experience many more Fridays and moments together. O oh Allah, grant us good things in this world and the good things in the, in the next life, and save us for the, from the punishment of the fire. O oh Allah, aid us in accepting the tests and tribulations of this life, and give us the strength to overcome any challenges that we may face. O oh Allah, rid us of our anxiety, our despair, our sorrow, and replace in us a sense of serenity and tranquility. O oh Allah, we ask you to place peace and solace in the hearts of those suffering any injustices. O oh Allah, we hope for your mercy. Do not leave us to ourselves, even for the blinking of an eye. Correct each of our affairs for us. There is none worthy of worship but you. If I have said anything of truth, it is from Allah alone, and my gratitude goes to Allah. If I have said anything that was not of truth, then that is from my own ego, and I ask for forgiveness from that transgression. Amin.